Okay, ready? Uh, sure, I was bored. I was bored. Really good. 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 Okay, I'm going to call to order the uh, City Council Transportation Energy and Utilities Committee at 4.08. And then I would entertain a Recording in progress. Sorry, I'm uh, calling to order the Transportation Energy Energy and Utilities Committee at 408, and I entertain a motion on our agenda. I would move the adoption of the agenda. I would second that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 We have an agenda. The next item on that agenda is the adoption of the minutes from our meeting on the 9th of this month. Uh, I would move the adoption of those minutes as presented. I would second that. Um, and seeing no discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, next, we have a public forum. Do we have any members from the public who'd like to speak? No, 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 I neither. Yeah. Wow. Come on. <laughs> Um, so uh, open and closed public forum, and we're on to our deliberative agenda. And the first thing is a Main Street, Great Streets construction update. And I'm assuming the law is not I'm here for that. Yep. I don't know if Chapin wants to. Well, I will just say that we added this to the agenda uh, last week when it became apparent that the contractor had um, uh, envisioned a different start uh, sequencing for this project. And so we really wanted to come to you directly and talk about the communications we are going to be having with the public. Uh, and I'll have Laura go into details of that. This is going to be a massive generational upgrade to 100 year old infrastructure under Main Street, but it's not going to come without some challenges. And uh, we are going to be working with you all together to minimize those impacts. Laura, why don't you frame up? Uh, a little bit about the sequencing of the work. Yep, so in conversations with SC Ireland, um, they've always been clear that they want to start on the routine sewers bypass construction. Um, so this will essentially take the existing ravine sewer flow offline with a new large pipe. Um, initially, their proposal, when they presented it to us in their bid, indicated that they would start um, at the intersection of Maple and Church. Conversations last week, uh, they have requested to alter that and actually start in the intersection in the middle of Main Street as their first location, um, working on the sewer pipe that actually goes between the Main Street and the back of Fire Station 1. Um, what this is, so starting the week of February 5th, this sewer manhole, which is actually um, Maddie is showing the graphic of the area. The red line is the new sewer pipe that's to be installed. The location is a little on the southern side of Main Street. So it's kind of on the opposite side of the road from where they eventually will continue work, which means that they have to dig a 24 foot deep hole across Main Street and they've requested that they close that block to traffic while they're doing this work. Um, it is a reasonable request based on the scale of the work and the size of equipment that they have going on. Um, we've looked at, even though the road is really wide through there, it would be difficult based on its location and the fact that they have to go immediately north of here to keep the road open. Um, that road closure would be for about two weeks. Is their anticipated time that they think that that work will take before they're able to open traffic up one way off the hill. So that is eastbound that way on the back. Um, it'll be about another week as they continue to work on the pipe going north before that they can clear two-way traffic. So somewhere between the third and fourth week, probably the fourth week, to be able to resume two-way traffic on the street. Our outreach, uh, let me first go back. The sidewalk on the south side would remain open in its entirety the entire time. Um, we do think that there's also going to be a, a lane that oh, they're going to use for their construction, but also that an emergency vehicle if needed to access on that block will be able to pass by. It's kind of our standard for construction sites, 14 foot path somewhere through there um, for emergency response. But pedestrian access entirely on the south side. The north side, you're going to have access to all the properties, but you won't be able to cross where that red line crosses towards the fire station. So there's going to be a lot of activity and eventually a very large hole 
um, to dig 25 feet in the ground to set to the new pipe. Sidewalk comes down across. On the north side, the north yeah. Side. That north side sidewalk will be interrupted during the work until so the there end be a crosswalk so that people who would be walking down there. It looks like that because you've got the, uh, yeah. the, the cut through from the library, right? Which some people may walk through there, not very many, but like later right. at night and down. So would we. Yep, we will take a look at what the library pattern is. My guess is we're going to direct them out to Union. We're going to try to direct pedestrians to cross the road at Union. Able-bodied people are going to do what able-bodied people can do, but um, we will work on making sure that signage and um, accessible routes are maintained. When would the road be closed? You said the February the week 5th. of February fifth is what the contractor has asked for. So we've already initiated email outreach to the all the property owners that are adjacent to this. Um, fire department received a communication yesterday, the gas station, Perry Winkles, um, the property owner that is between the fire station and Memorial received a communication yesterday along with the Flynn and Cafe Hot who has leased inside of the parking lot. Um, and then the residences received store hangers today. Um, we are preparing a um, reading on it is a final draft of an outreach that is going to go out to our entire outreach stakeholders list. Is there a, a reason why? So you have periwinkles, so that's the first one. It looks like that, I think it's the long gray. Yes. You know? yep. And uh, then, uh, but there are a couple of other places like Jay Skis. Yeah, and they do have their email. They received their communication they yesterday. We're bothered okay. with them tomorrow morning. And meeting with them with Laura and Cara uh, at 9 a.m. Um, um, and I just have a quick question. I'm sure that this has happened, but just want some clarity on it. Has there been communication with Edmonds about? Like, I'm sure that this would impact school drop off and pick up and just general tra like traffic from kids walking and then also cars and such. So what what will that look like? Yep, they received their notification with today's batch of outreach. Uh, and we fully expect and with our public outreach consultant, they're working on documents to help people with the detour routes. This would look like documents that the Shelburne Street Roundabout would have created when we had significant detours. Um, we are offering support to the schools to create a graphic uh, to assist with their parent pickup and drop off. Um, hopefully they take us up on it, um, but it does require a partnership there. We're going to support, um, so Periwinkles is probably the most significantly impacted that their driveway will actually be entirely closed for two weeks. They do have access off King Street, but the 25 foot hole is on each side of the opening of their driveway. There's two, two manholes. Um, so we're going to put up some signage to help people find the actual entrance to this business. Um, we are working with the Flynn as they have numerous shows throughout the month of February that they can put a communication in their ticket holder information that goes out right before the shows to the ticket holders. Um, the detour would be you detour people at Union and you split them. So Union is one way. One way um, right, so. but yes, the detour as you're coming into, into downtown as you will use Union to college to come around. Right. Um, GMT received some communication today. I apologize. They are on our list. <laughs> okay. Um, and then going out of town, we're directing people to Maple Street. So kind of splitting the volume of traffic. Obviously, people familiar with their transportation grid are going to do what they feel is comfortable to them, but those that are less informed um, will be directed in those ways. The lot by the fire department does not being closed. A okay. lot of the fire department closes the week of February 5th as well. Because of the size of lights deviation that's required to be able to do the work. Basically so, so that entire corner from Winooski to the construction is going to uh, be taken out of circulation. Mm -hmm. the, but the road but the road itself Winooski Avenue is not going to be closed. Correct. Winooski is going to remain open and the intersection at its entire um, entirety will remain open. It'll be local traffic only in the road 
in the road closed section. So people will still be able to get to the gas station driveway via Winooski. People will still be able to actually get to Jay Ski's driveway and parking via Union. Um, we're actually also going to add head in parking in front of Memorial to help replace some of the lost parking capacity um, while that block is closed. That's to help with people who do have blocked driveways and uh, is the circulation way. of that it head in as in like, like No, not even diagonal. Like you'll pull straight out like it's a parking lot and then you'll back out and go back out to Main Street. Very local, but in service of um, like the tattoo place that's on the north side and JCs and Imagine that people from Paramichaels will probably be willing to park there, some of them. That will be interesting when you have people to sort of manage that yes. lot when chaos occurs. And Sierra Island is planning a flagger at each end to, in support of both the pedestrian uh, questions that are going to come, how do I get here, as well as the vehicles looking to get into this area, making sure they have a legal destination. And also maybe the way they park. As yeah. somebody who works a parking lot yeah. on weekends, the Madrid <laughs> and Sunny area is very neat, I, very helpful there. Yes, uh, we, we did uh, mention to some of the adjacent property owners that we told about this parking, that directing people of how this is going to look, because we don't want to strike that. We're just going to have to go against the flow of what's there. So we probably should be open to somebody actually stand there <laughs> with their yellow vests and go here. Yep. My last question about this is about like how long we think the closure will be. I mean, are there is there good, a fair amount of certainty about the three to four week time frame, or could it be longer? It's a pretty limited scope for what they need to do initially. Um, the first structure they think it's going to take them a week to dig it and set it and backfill, and then basically one crew turns into two crews. One goes east and does another structure of similar depth. The other one goes north and starts setting the pipe until they really get proximate to uh, the main Amanuski lot. Inside of that lot, because of where the sewer is going to go, we have to actually remove the western retaining wall that goes down to the back of the fire station. Um, so that wall has to be demoed. The, the entire, I don't know if you can zoom in more, Maddie. Um, the amount of work space that this is going to take up is pretty sizable. The red line is drawn. It looks really close to the property line, but it's really like 15 or 20 feet in. So the first bay of parking to the air monitoring station is essentially going to be excavation. The second bay is going to be what they excavated. And the third bay is being held for firefighter staff parking uh, on site there both in what they're losing adjacent to their building because of the excavation, as well as the loss of being able to go um, down the back rack where they park staff. Answer. Weather. Weather? Weather, yeah. As far, <laughs> you know, like, there is some of that. There you built in budge for, or is there? I think it's fair to say that our uh, press release is going to have a disclaimer for all timelines that they could be extended based on extenuating circumstances. So while there's some wiggle in there, certainly we're at the control of Mother Nature here. But and work can be done in this, uh, you know, at what yeah. weather does it like yeah. cease to be possible to? They essentially just need to keep the material unfrozen, which you can do with blankets and bringing in material that's not part of the top of a surface pile. As long as they are compacting it as unfrozen material, they are allowed to continue work. Um, the other up piece of the update is basically once we start allowing one-way traffic back on Main Street, that crew is going to move to the intersection of Church and Maple. And that intersection will be closed while they do that work, which is about a three week time frame. Um, and then they will move north from there. The, the one thing that I was thinking about when you started talking about closing Main Street is, um, and the reason I asked about the certainty around how long it'll be closed is we have this eclipse thing coming up in April, yeah. which they're, you know, based on projections, could be 50,000 people coming to the city. And we would certainly need Main Street 
for that. And I don't know about if yeah. you're factoring the eclipse of that into any of the construction schedule. Or the other. eclipse has gone into every construction contract okay. that we have left for the holiday. Um, there are a few ongoing ones that uh, it doesn't appear, but we're letting people know as, as far and wide as we can, including that contractor stops the potential challenges of that time. Great. Make it's sure a whole, will, whole weekend, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Main Street should not have active construction on it from this project at that specific time. They will be working in the main Amadusi lot. They will be working on Church Street, uh, but not on the street. Yes. So um, the communication that I have in front of me will go to all counselors a little later today. So you'll receive the notes from the update. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing would be to just keep us posted. I think that yeah. the eclipse is, you know, is a marker that's going to uh, continue to make people be worried, right? As you know, in whatever other kind of like giant yeah. event, uh, St. Patrick's Day, another one of those fine days when Ireland uh, tries to bring their trucks into into town. Maybe they can just honk the trucks that they have into it. Point taken. I think one of the challenges we've had is some businesses see this as peak season for them. The Flynn and Jay skis. Other businesses see it as the off season. Yeah. And so we were trying to work with businesses to avoid impact. And yet their, their busy seasons are, are all over the map. So. Anna, do you have anything else? Nope. Thank you, though. Okay, well, thank you for that update. Thank you. We look yeah. forward to getting through that critical phase. I'm sure you do as well. Both ways. Um, the next uh, yes. item on our agenda is the GMT FY25 assessment and fair resumption. Hey, everybody, how are you? Glad to be back. Uh, to talk to the committee about things that are happening with GMT. And um, as usual, I think I have uh, kind of a mixed bag of, of uh, things that uh, are going well, things that uh, need work, and, uh, and we'll see somehow how I, or what you all think of those and respond. Um, the things that I want to talk about is the assessment, um, our return to fairs, and uh, the, the equity considerations that go into the, the fair system. Um, also, understand that there may be some interest on the committee here about the state non federal match uh, study that just uh, was published. Happy to dive into there. So, my thinking was that I would go over the assessment, um, then go into the fairs, and then talk about the federal match study. Does that make sense to, to you all? Yeah. And, and Hannah, I'm sorry that I'm not looking at you since I'm looking at, at, at uh, the counselors in the room, so please don't be. Uh, Disturbed that I'm ignoring you. I'm I'm not offended, but thank you. Thank you. And there is a one pager that you submitted that's in the documents that everybody yes. has seen. Yes, thank you, Great. Thank you Jacob. And uh, and so that just addressed specifically the, the equity concerns regarding the fairs because I thought that there would be some stats there that um, would uh, be interesting to you all. Um, before we dive into uh, those topics, I do want to just let you know that we've uh, had some good news um, in terms of our ride, overall ridership numbers uh, for the first six months of our fiscal year, uh, going July to December, we've had over a million rides, and uh, October uh, was our highest ridership month uh, uh, since the pandemic, and so we're, we're happy to see that, uh, that the rebound uh, that started earliest in, in our urban service continues and that um, uh, ridership is, is riding hopefully so that we can continue to get uh, to the levels that we previously had. Um, jumping into the assessment, uh, the overall assessment as it stands now um, is 1 million or 1.9 million. It's up 4.1% over the previous year. Um, when you look at that breakout, uh, Burlington uh, was very flat when it came to paratransit. That's the ADA service for folks who are unable to use the, um, uh, the fixed route service. And uh, that can fluctuate immensely. 
depending on the uh, number of users in the area. And in Burlington, it was uh, uh, the paratransit rate only went up 0.3%. We've had one of our communities that went up 55% in one year. So um, I tell you that because one of the things that the board has done since I was last year is that we adopted a new paratransit assessment methodology that will use a running average to help make those peaks and valleys less drastic because we understand the negative bu budget impacts of that. Uh, looking at the fixed route assessment, um, the uh, that went up by 4%. And when you look at the ridership um, um, and you project it out over a year and then you look at the assessment that uh, the assessment comes to just under a um, dollar a ride. You know, so just to give you an idea of what uh, the contribution is for, for folks who are for using the service. Uh, one of the things that I want to uh, uh, bring up is that there, over the past four years, has been an overpayment uh, that Burlington has made. One of the things that's a challenge uh, with putting together the GMT budget is that we put it out um, free, or we, we have to craft our budget before we know whether we're going to be fair free or not. And so what ended up happening is, is that we continue to assess you, uh, you in Burlington uh, for routes uh, uh, that traditionally have been fair free, the College Street Shuttle, and we continue to assess those uh, during the pandemic. And that means that there is a $336,000 uh, overpayment that has happened over the past four years. Um, I can tell you that uh, our, what our plan is, is to have that be removed uh, from your assessment over time uh, to bring you back to whole. And I'm sorry that that was something that didn't be, uh, wasn't caught until somewhat recently. Uh, the, um, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure the uh, Board of Commissioners will meet one more time uh, to discuss the fiscal year 25 budget. And so I'm not sure if that will begin with fiscal year 25's assessment, in which case it would be um, a reduction there or if it will be end of the following year. Um, and so I know that we had already sort of built our fiscal year 25 budget uh, without having a return. And so uh, it would require us to do some additional budgetary work, but that's not your problem, that's ours. And uh, and so our, our plan is, um, again, over time to, to make you whole of that and over what period of time? I would like it to be as soon as possible. Um, I can tell you that really it's just going to depend on how much it will impact our local uh, our local match. Um, there's been a proposal of having it over 10 years. I think that's too long. How long was it? As, how long was the period that it was assessed for? Four years. Four years. Yeah. And if this is one counselor who would say that if you went over a four year period, yeah. you would be it, be it would be highly inequitable. Okay. Well, uh, you know, sooner would be, I, I think, the most appropriate, you know, when there are refunds, but uh, understood. And uh, certainly uh, uh, we're going to put things in place so that we identify these earlier so that we can do an immediate return as opposed to hoping this is the gap has grown and how do we do this without uh, impacting our local matchability to draw down funds. And so I am uh, happy to bring that message. Um, back to thank you. You could tell them that if there were things like shortages on uh, assessments or on taxes, that there'd be penalties and interest. So yeah. perhaps <laughs> if we're not going to assess you penalties and interest, we should get it back a little quicker. I, I, I will let them know that uh, you're offering us a great deal. I am offering you a really good deal. Maybe yes. even Absolutely. two years. We'll, we'll sign on to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll waive, so we'll that's waive that's the penalties and interest. Like, okay, we have a, a motion in a second for yeah. four years with zero interest. Uh, zero interest. Let's see if Hannah can uh, get us over the, the uh, uh, open line. Okay. The, uh, uh, should have made it too, but I appreciate uh, your uh, flexibility. Thank you. So that's where the, the assessment is. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm really happy about um, is that when I was here before, I talked to you about like our overtime rate being so high and um, that has come down some because we have um, uh, had had success with uh, recruiting. I think I told you before about eliminating the starting rate so that we were able to 
uh, do a better job of bringing in new drivers without actually really significantly increasing our costs because it only applies to folks who are in the first year. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm just saying is, is that I'm pleased that even with an overtime rate of 30%, we're able to keep the assessment you know, growth just to, to the 4%. Um, so let's talk about fares. So uh, before you do that, yeah. okay. So um, the you had the adjustment for an overpayment. Yes. Um, is that is that line item now removed from the budget? So is that how, how did you know? So I think that that's what the board will uh, the board of commissioners at GMT will be deciding is that um, if it will apply to 25 and then- Well, I'm not talking about the refund. I'm sort of talking about, so, okay, we paid over. Yeah. So like in now in the payments now- Oh, yes, how, yes. yes. How, should, how is that? I should be uh, clear that for fiscal year 25, I'll be asking for that not to be you know, included, which will, will reduce the overall 336 number because that included you know, flight. But, uh, and so, yes, that, that I will be asking. Because so, it doesn't make sense for them to continue to collect it over the debt when it has it in violence. That would be fundamentally wrong. And yes, I agree. So that plays into the next topic because it is about our policy and what Burlington wants moving forward, and whether we want fair free service or not. Correct. And so one of the things that uh, you've heard me say before, and I'll, and I'll reiterate, is that um, you know, the, the Board of Commissioners, the GMT Board of Commissioners, made a priority of service pre uh, preservation over uh, fare free service. Um, can, can sort of carrying that through, uh, one of the things that we would uh, like not to do is to have a fare free route as we've had in the past. One of the reasons why we're comfortable with that is because we believe that the new um, fare system is much more economically equitable uh, to folks, and I'm gonna kind of walk through that. Um, the other thing that I did want to bring up is that, and I, I think that I've mentioned it to you all before, is that, um, you know, the decision to return to fares was largely made at the state level um, with the state transportation bill, and that did set a 10% uh, revenue target for us. And so that target um, is something that uh, when we put our fare system back into place, uh, we couldn't sort of just you know, hand out discounts as much as we would like because we wouldn't be able to meet the, uh, the target. And so, um, but with that in mind, uh, what we know is that based on uh, using our existing um, discounts for uh, riders who are between six and 17, uh, 60 and uh, over, and who have a self-identified disability, we know about half of our riders qualify for those discounts. Um, and so those folks would have a fare of $1 and there would be caps that would keep them at the two and the 25, which you've heard me talk about before. Really what makes the system far more equitable um, is, is the accessibility of those caps. Because when you look at um, our most cost-effective way to use public transit before, people had to buy that monthly pass. They had to fork over um, 50 or $40, depending on the time um, to get that. The, and as a result, only 17% of the rides that we provided were to somebody who was using a monthly pass. So most people were not getting any type of discount um, uh, over, uh, for usage. They may have the discount because of their age or because of having a disability, but, uh, but there would be no cap to what they would spend. Um, and so without that cap, we know that, you know, 83% of our rides did not come about uh, from, a, uh, from a pass, a monthly pass. And so somebody who is a workday rider, and I'm defining that as just somebody who Monday through Friday goes to work, it's 22 days on average each month. Um, and so those folks who weren't discounted would pay $66 a month, and those who were discounted would pay $33. And again, under the new system, um, it'd be capped at 50 and 25. And based if our if our past usage um, is uh, consistent, which I know is a very big if because you know the world has changed significantly since 2020. But based on what we think we know about our riders, uh, we think that there's a very good chance that half of our riders will get to the cap uh, during that month. So half of our riders. 
uh, will, will have that price protection. And so that's why we're going from essentially uh, having 17% of rides um, be price protected, probably from folks who can afford the price protections. Now we'll have price protections for half of the folks and they don't they don't have to pay anything. Uh, we also really like uh, the fact that they don't have to worry about the risk. Um, hey, I think I'm gonna use transit a lot this month. They don't have to make that guessing game. And they don't have to worry about losing the, the piece of paper and then that value is completely gone. Uh, they got of course. The uh, and lastly, what also really helps with the uh, equity is the ability to um, you know travel out of the region where previously they were going to be sort of stuck uh, in urban local, um, and now they'll be able to get uh, to Montpelier, uh, to St Albans, uh, to Heinz, uh, Heinz sorry, part of that, to, to Jeffersonville. Um, you know, the commuter lines, they're going to be able to get those um, where before there was a premium for those longer distance routes. Um, so that's sort of the equity of the um, of the system itself. Why I think it's going to be much better for our, uh, for our riders. Um, and I do want to bring up, because this is something that uh, we're going to be talking to the, the legislature about, is that I really feel strongly that what is hurting um, our growth in ridership and also uh, making our ridership less equitable, you know, is just the public safety problem that we are all, you know, managing here in Burlington. Uh, we know that we have heard from riders who are physically vulnerable, especially from older riders, that they don't feel comfortable using the service. Um, and, and that applies to both uh, the uh, in, internal, our employees, we've had some female employees, we had a bus driver uh, quit because she just said, no, I no longer feel safe being out here uh, driving in the community, um, and, uh, and as well as the external. Um, one of the things that sort of has surprised me is that in the past six months, we received more daily email contacts from people asking us to return to fair service than asking us to continue having uh, fares be free. I never expected that. And I'm sure that come March 6th, there will be plenty of people, uh, more people. But one of the things that is almost always identified, there was one person who I was like, I wanted to like frame his because he had this impassioned, you know, uh, fares are part of the keeping uh, the economic viability of public transit. And I'm just like, whoa, if everybody was like him, that'd be amazing. Um, but everybody uh, but that awesome fellow uh, was really focused on, you know, the physical security that, that they feel that uh, it is not um, uh, safe for them. And, um, and, you know, we had one of our riders who provided input and, and you know, her statement is from her perception. Our, our buses have become mobile day stations and you know that she's just not you know sure that she can continue to use the service even though she's been using it for 20 years and has been happy not to have to have a car. Um, one of the things that uh, has really been a challenging at the downtown transit center is that uh, I know how important the access to public restrooms are uh, for equity for folks uh, who are unhoused. Uh, but the unfortunate reality is, is that that means that those bathrooms are frequently used um, as a place uh, to safely use drugs and that that then will lead to conflict that leads to medical events uh, that are happening at the transit center uh, that again people don't really want to be around. Um, one of the things that really has shocked me having lived in Vermont for 20 some odd years and, and believing that we were in this beautiful um, you know, liberal paradise that I love was the amount of racial um, uh, disharmony, you know, that occurs at the transit center. We have, uh, we have uh, our, our transit center supervisor um, is a new American. Uh, he is, you know, somewhat regularly referred to, you know, to his face as the N-word. Uh, we have people who are um, using uh, uh, racial slurs, you know, yelling and screaming. Um, and the thing that's a challenge is that, you know, these aren't necessarily riders. You know, 
These are people that are, you know, adjacent to the transit center when they when they need to uh, when their addiction is, you know, is on them. They need they use our public restroom and then and then come off. Um, and uh, and so it creates a situation uh, where we've had uh, really negative encounters between students from Burlington High School and uh, the unhoused population that's uh, there. Um, and we've also seen uh, what appears to be the, the targeting. We had a, 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 a black rider who was just sitting on the phone, minding his own business, and you know people ran onto the platform, sprayed him in the face with bear spray, and ran away. You know, we, we don't know what the cause of that was, but it appears to be a targeted, uh, you know, attack. And it just has really surprised me um, at, at what is happening there. And, uh, and so, you know, uh, coming from somebody who has worked in human services and has about the most progressive, you know, views that, uh, uh, of, of the people that I work with, you know, one of the things that I, you know, also get concerned about is if we were going to have fare free service on just one or two routes, that that may concentrate sort of the negative behaviors uh, on those. And uh, but that's just speculation. I don't, you know, I don't know if that's actually what would be the case. Uh, but it would be something that I would be worried about. So sorry to um, kind of take the fares into the. Uh, the safety issue, but it is something that we're going to be talking to the legislature about. Uh, we're hoping that our next grant application with VTrans uh, is going to include additional funds to help us with uh, security enhancements. We are not looking for uh, like traditional law enforcement security enhancements. Uh, one of the things that I'm really uh, proud of is that we're partnering with Pathways uh, Vermont. Uh, to have training to staff on de-escalation because I think that a lot of the um, a lot of the de-escalation training that is available through the transit industry um, is you know making an assumption that the person that you're de-escalating is not having an uh, overdose medical event is not having a, a sort of psychotic break and there's different approaches that you want to take uh, to there and the thing that I really love about their approach is that it's um, they refer to it as a relationship based approach because that person uses our service and we can't respond to them in such a way that is going to poison their use of that service uh, in the future and so i'm hoping that that will, will, will uh, really be effective um Anything about fares? I know that I've blasted you all in the past about the, the new system. Oh, there's one really cool thing about the new system that um, I wanted to let you know that's ongoing. Um, we, uh, DIVA, uh, the Medi state Medicaid agency, uh, has a program that provides uh, free bus transportation for Medicaid recipients who have been verified to not have access to a vehicle. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, it was estimated that there was about 120 folks that met that uh, category in the Burlington area. Um, Diva thinks that that may be close to 500 now. One of the things that is uh, uh, really positive, excuse me, is that CMS has loosened the guidelines on that program. And what they realized is that by only paying for uh, a person's ride to a medical appointment, they're actually spending more money in verification than it would be just to buy a person a monthly pass. And so, uh, so we're working with Diva and the people that are on Medicaid uh, who have the verified lack of a vehicle uh, in their household um, looks very much likely that they will be able to get free service, um, free transit service. So that's something that to their medical provider like out to Pilly Lane plus they, they'll be able to, to, to use it. The, it'll be just a monthly pass. Yeah. And so we think that's going to be a huge uh, uh, equity improvement. Um, and the new system will help us because uh, one of the things that we'll have to be able to do is that um, even though the verification requirements are less, um, we still have to show that they used our system within the month. And, and so it will be a very easy report for us to be able to get out of the new system where previously you'd have no idea whether they used their pass or not. 
quickly before you leave fares, I think the policy question for us all to grapple with is currently the Burlington in our assessment pays for part of Route 11, the mm -hmm. former College Street shuttle, to yeah. be fare free. And there was a council resolution in 2021 regarding North Winooski Avenue to make the city loop fare free. So what staff is recommending, I certainly, uh, I fall on the preserving service side of things in lieu of uh, fair free service because our financials are so tight, but we've had other direction from the council. So should there be a desire to adjust the fair free designation on the College Street Shuttle Route 11 and not implement fair free service on the city loop because the new fare system is equitable. I think that would be something that this committee should recommend to the full board. If that's not your direction, then we should have that conversation as it will impact our assessment in FY25. So the, yeah. the original College Street shuttle idea really was premised on getting university students up and down the hill, it's a big hill. It also is the medical center. Uh, we were looking to really keep the waterfront vital. So there are a number of different public policies that are integrated with that. Yeah. And for me, the key is to be analyzing the effectiveness of that with the eye to in increasing usership and um, mm -hmm. so it may be that we haven't done that analysis in which case I probably would be I would want to see the numbers for College Street to really understand who is being affected yes. and how much and then the you know the out you know, the outcome of, you know, like how people are going to, because if all that all people are doing is going up and down, which is important from say the, the waterfront to the library, right? And they're, they're, they don't have to, it's about half a mile. To get there. But it's a, it's a long, steep half, half mile for a lot of people. Yes. Then, um, you know, I mean, that will tell us something different than the numbers if you go all the way up the hill as well. So uh, before I would be willing to make that, I would really like to be able to see those numbers and also see how we can encourage um, increased ridership from the populations that are there consistent with doing this part of transportation demand management, uh, which I don't know that we're doing at a, a great job as a as a city and in a way it's sort of a similar but different look at the city because it you know we're looking at Manuski Avenue just we're parking from Manuski Avenue so you know what's the you know the transportation demands there we've had one study uh goes up I it goes up to Fern Hill City Loop yes. I think it does go it goes yes. up there yeah those are folks that probably are under card, right? And need to get places. So, um, and then the last piece of my thinking on this, just as if, you know, we're looking at this as a dollar a ride, but a dollar to go from the waterfront to the library is a lot more money than a dollar that would go take you from Burlington to Winooski. Yes. Right. So the, the you know so the equities that are involved in the buck right, even if we're going to cap it, I just I, I just sort of raise that in terms of the way we're looking at the um, at the service in this relationship to the fee, and I you know there there's some value to people not having to walk up the hill, but, you know, so that might mitigate some of that, but. You know what I mean with that. One of the things that's going to be very helpful to us is that we'll have another granularity uh, when it comes to uh, how it's how the service is used. But we're also going to be able to have 
um, that granularity as far as, hey, we know this route um, has 70% of its riders are discount riders instead of you know, the, the, the normal 50-50. You know, and that will help us, I think, in making decisions as well, because we're going to just have a better understanding of what uh, each of those were, the populations of those routes are serving. I uh, do want to let you know that we are uh, restarting the same unlimited access program for students uh, at the University of Vermont, and so that they'll be able to continue as they have in the past uh, to have uh, the university pay for their, uh, their rides. And um, it's really kind of, uh, I, I love it when the economics work so that you have a financial incentive to do the right thing. And the way um, the FTA, Federal Transportation Administration, treats um, fares is not entirely as a pure local match. It's not as valuable as a pure local match. But the money that we generate from the unlimited user access agreement with the University of Vermont is totally treated as, as local match. So when we find other payers to pay for people's rides, it, it, it improves our financial position. And that's going to be a huge incentive for us to continue, you know, finding employers, schools, um, you know, developers, developers yes, uh, you know, to pay uh, for there because that will make our money go much farther. Hannah, did you want to get in with any questions? I don't think so. I'm still thinking about it right now. Okay. I, I have a question about, there's no action on our agenda on this, Correct. but uh, you were just suggesting that you need direction from us, so. I think, yeah, I think it's kind of, a, I need you to start thinking about it now and get direction, like Gene just right. offered about what information you need, and then, frankly, I think a decision needs to be made one way or another, what happens in FY25, so. So in what time frame is that decision made? You know, I would Man. I would hope that by next month, uh, I mean, yeah. we need to set the assessment yeah. for Burlington and while ADA is past years, the fare free uh, is real time. So if we don't, if we don't charge a fare on the shuttle, we'll be paying what they've assigned to us. If we decide it is going to pay a fare, then actually our assessment goes down in FY25. Yeah, and so we need to understand that so they can build the city up appropriately. We February fifteenth is uh, when we're statutorily required to have a budget done. Got it. So do we need to meet in? Do we need to make that decision now, or do we need to? Do we make it, or, or do we at least we're making? We're not making. We're making. We're your other right. recommendation, right. and then you would bring that. But you're not looked. But you're looking for it before the fifteenth. I would just say that if we wanted to make like major decisions about making a route fare free or not, that in order for us to include it in our budget, we would have to have it by that. You know, we do things outside the budget cycle all the time. That's what budget just adjustments are for. Just letting you know that that's the, the constraint that we have. Okay. Um, can I just ask a question? And I apologize if you already referenced this, but um, just thinking about the fare free model, do you, what's the data on have you experienced that when a route is fare free, more folks um, utilize the bus service, or like how does how has ridership varied when a route is fare free versus when it's not? If that makes sense. So the the reality is is that we don't have real world data here in Burlington because what drove the fare free, of course, was the the worldwide you know pandemic that influenced. Uh, how public transit is used. Uh, what I can tell you is, is that during our fare-free time, uh, we have never gotten to our peak fare service uh, that we had during fares. And, um, and so, um, so I, I'm not sure that we uh, have the information that in today's world, that fare-free service will get us back to uh, you know, those amounts. We, we may not see it ever get back to that, although that's obviously not the direction that we want to move in. Um, the, uh, shoot, you said something. Oh, we have studied um, the potential impact of uh, returning to fares, and the estimate uh, 
uh, was a 16% reduction. And, uh, you know, like one of the things that I've noticed when I ride is that, uh, and I think Gene, you sort of alluded to this in, in some of your other comments. Um, I remember being on the on the Pine Street, and um, and somebody jumped on the bus, and they literally got off two stops. I mean, it was like two hundred yards. Sure. And and so like that person probably in the future, if there was a fair, would just say, "I'm going to walk that." Um, and so I think that a, a lot of those uh, uh, decreases are probably going to be sort of similar situations where where people are, are uh, going to have uh, the threshold for the convenience will be raised up just a little bit because of that. I think depending on the number of times that you jump on for that 200, and that may be a reason to have a card. Yes. I, from my own perspective, I am open for one, for this year, and only this year, not like, okay, set it and forget it, um, looking at a return to fares if and really only if we have a capacity and a commitment <laughs> to look at the, excuse me, the TDM, um, look at TDM to see about the maximization of ridership so that we are working with TATMA, uh, you know, and you have UVM there, but we are looking, you know, like Minuski Avenue, the city loop, well, the the, the, um, the the food shelter is right there. Mm -hmm. Pathways is right there. There are all these players. Yes. You know, the Mascoma Bank has got a branch there because they got a commitment to doing uh, public banking. So we've got, you know, all around the place. So the idea of us actively trying to get cards in people's hands Trying to trying to see if people are eligible and not just making it well, it's out there somewhere in the ether, but actually pushing disc discount things. Right, doing doing an evaluation of other income groups and employers, really sort of looking at this in a way like we were talking with Bird in terms of the um, the commuting aspect of it and getting like to the medical center so that we can start to um, to build it. And if we did that, if we got a commitment to do that, which includes not, it's just not on you, it's on CAPMA, it's on our planning department, then um, it, it would be worth having people have those cards so we can get the data and we can start to, to make these choices because we could always decide that we're gonna change the fee structure to accommodate, you know, lower wage working people. Yes. Which is something that I want. You know, the person making 20 bucks an hour these days is not making a lot of money. They're they are a poor working person. And if they can we can help them get to work, get to the doctor, get to the grocery store, that would be really helpful. I, I totally agree. You know, one of the things that uh it's a double-edged sword when somebody uh sets a 10% revenue goal because because now I'm like, oh, well, I don't have to generate more than 10%. Yeah. So, so if we find that usage goes up and the data says that we can make adjustments or offer more discounts, I'm happy to follow that path. I think you have um, another question. Yeah. And um, so kind of like along those, the lines that Jean just referenced, like just thinking about um, like other communities in Burlington, like uh new Vermonters and such that um, like new American communities, like how, how is this information relayed to them? Like, is there translation services? Like thinking about the card structure, yes. like it, will it be, will it be offered in other languages? Cause I know even for me, someone that has so much information just readily available and like it is very simple for me to have access to this thinking about what that will look like for someone that like english is not a first language um is there any idea of how these changes if there are changes how it will be communicated to them uh, absolutely i'm glad that you asked um as we speak we are polishing up uh we had a contractor uh, provide us with 
um, informational videos that are um, in the most popular languages that are in the Burlington area. With our Title VI um, program, we're required to track uh, the languages that are used in our service zone. And so I can't remember the exact number of languages that were translated, but we're going to have um, these one minute videos uh, that will be first, like we're going to return to fair service. And this is what fairs are and just you know, the concept. Then we're here's how you create your account. And then here's how you get on the bus and use it. And so those will be um, available to folks. Um, we are uh, partnering with um, uh, the organizations that serve those communities by sending them information. And really what you're going to see is that this February is going to be our sort of, uh, you know, media blitz, you know, time uh, where we try to get ready. Uh, the system will be live uh, either this week or next week with us to be able to start creating people's accounts. And, uh, and so the hope is, is that by the time March 6th rolls around, the vast majority of riders have already created their account. Um, we know that about 90% of our riders um, use smartphones. And so to be able to create an account will be as simple as downloading the Duncan app. And, um, uh, and then for those folks uh, who want to use a card because they prefer not to use their phone or because they don't have a phone or because they want to be a cash-based rider, they'll be able to use the smart cards and uh, we will have people at the uh, center, you know, uh, available to create the accounts for them. Awesome, thank you. Um, I, I, I think we need one, probably want to wrap this up soon. Yeah. I, I am, I am sure. really concerned about the, the security situation you described, especially at the downtown transit center. We can do all we want with fair structures and everything to incentivize riders, but if people, aren't feeling safe, they're not gonna use the service. I totally agree. And I know it, I know we have the school, at least for another two years, it's gonna be yes. just down the street there. Yes. Um, so we really need to address, make sure that gets addressed. If you need advocacy in your in your um, your state outreach, you know, I'm, I'm certain the council and the administration would be willing to help you with that. But one of the things you mentioned was around um, how you want to um, improve the security situation there. And um, is there, there isn't like, it's basically on the deep downtown transit center staff right now to manage the security situation. Yes. Um, is there any interest in having a security presence, even if it were private security, try to, it would help Deter and we have been unable to find a security provider that has the capacity. Okay. We have uh, reached out uh, to sheriff's departments. We've reached out to the Burlington Police, of course. So everyone knows their capacity. We reached out to Chocolate Thunder, um, and and the reality is, is that they just don't have the capacity for a daily uh, security support. Yeah. Well. It seems like that would be helpful to your situation I, currently, even I, if it wasn't a long term strategy, it would be. A, 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 I couldn't so, agree more. Okay, I couldn't agree. Good. Um, and yeah, any, go ahead, Hannah. I just have a quick, sorry, a quick question on that. When an incident happens on a bus, yes. do you, like what does, does the driver call the police? Like if it's in Burlington, do they call BPD? How is that handled? Um, so when there is an incident, the first call goes to the supervisor. Um, we have uh, supervisors on staff um, just about all the time that we, and I, I don't mean on staff, uh, on, you know, working in the area just about all the times that we have uh, buses running, they kind of come, over, come out and be the first responder to that. They'll make the assessment of whether they need to uh, include uh, law enforcement uh, there. Um, if it's an obvious law enforcement situation, then, um, you know, the driver potentially could call 911 themselves, but it usually uh, goes through with the supervisor. In most cases, um, it's able to be de-escalated and resolved there. Um, and then what happens is, is that we make a determination about whether or not the individual um, should be able to continue to use the service. And, uh, and then we, um, uh, we do an incident uh, write-up our supervisory group meets on a bi-weekly basis to review the incidents. 
um, to watch the, generally there's videos because all of our buses in the transit center have uh, good security cameras uh, systems. Um, and then we make an evaluation of whether that person is um, safe to continue using the service. It's not a punitive no trespass. It's entirely based on whether the individual would be a, uh, a reasonably be a threat to uh, employees, other riders. And, uh, and if necessary, then we'll end up um, no trespassing the individual. I can tell you the enforcement of that no trespass is extremely difficult. Um, because you know we are not law enforcement. We'll have people who will continue to attempt to use the service, um, and we have to use our soft skills to sort of de-escalate those situations. Um, but you know the the thing that scares our staff. Um, you, we just look at the past week. Um, the individual involved in the armed standoff yesterday is a frequent GMT rider that we've had the no trespass. The person that burned down several buildings in Winooski this past week is a person who is, you know, a, a GMT rider that we frequently know trespassed. Um, you know, and so, you know, and we are part of the Church Street Marketplace uh, uh, Community Security Group. We are all, you know, sort of, we know the same, you know, people that they do. And and, uh, um, and, and the unfortunate reality is, is that, um, you know, that small subset of the population is really making it you know, less uh, viable for the whole. Thanks. Um, any any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, I think one of the things that we need to nail down is this um, the idea of a recommendation or an action on the part of this committee by February fifteenth. Anybody have ideas about how we can? You know, I, I'm kind of sick for having more meetings than anybody else cares to have. So I would be, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to to do that if that if, if if there was a deadline. Otherwise, I just hope that we could do it at our next meeting. Yeah, I guess my thought is to not try to get it done before the 15th. And the, the, the impact, the, the financial impact of the through shuttle, we pay about 57000 in foregone fares. I don't know, Clay. I look to you and Nick. Would it be possible for Burlington to make that decision a little later? Yes. We do a mid-year budget adjust. We absolutely do. Yeah, we could we could put an action on our yes. uh, February schedule. Yeah, the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Looks like the yeah. other time. I'm going to have to do that by uh, looks like by remote. By the way, because I'm taking care of babies. But okay. Besides that, and just to make sure that we're clear is that you know at that point in time we're going to be able to tell you what our past not so great data is for those uh, for those routes. Um, and uh, and so, you know, we won't actually have the, you know, the better data to look at. Um, I think that by the summer, we'll start to have some clarity on, on usage um, uh, because we'll have a couple of months uh, with students you know, and some months without students. And I think that that'll be a good picture of what's to do. Could you provide it, it, it with the, if we were to, Go away from fare free on that. Could you provide us with a look at the, this year's assessment, what the increases are, but then break that up so we can yeah. be able yes. to tell what uh, what savings we would be uh, having for the city? Yes. And so I know that it, it would be the one point nine two eight uh, million minus fifty seven. And then the question would be, knowing our, our four-year commitment, whether we um, are able to get uh, the, the first uh, sort of return into the into 25, um, or if we're not able to do that until 26. Uh, so we, we should be able to do that. And do we, did we do the um, no fare on the city loop, or? It's still, the whole system's fare free. So, so, so we, we haven't, haven't, haven't been able to have an assessment on that. So far, right. okay. got it. The only, the only route it is the only Street Yeah. Yes. That's the only part of the assessment. That's right. But yeah. to be clear, by March 6th, yeah. there will be a fare reinstated on the city loop as well as everything other than the College Street shuttle, such that if we make a decision to go fare free on the city loop, that wouldn't start until July 1. Right. Right. Thank you. And thank you. All the fares on College won't start until July 3rd. Correct. We we didn't um, uh, 
We didn't cover the non federal match study. And uh, the Reader's Digest is, is that uh, in fiscal year 26, GMT Urban will run out of its uh, uh, COVID relief funds. We have a projected one and a half to $2 million deficit in fiscal year 26. Uh, we have a projected $3 million deficit in fiscal year 27. Um, and certainly finding that uh, gap is my job number one because that's how we're going to be able to uh, keep the current level of service. So in a legislative report, I read that uh, there is discussion at the state level for a, a sustainable funding plan. It would be very helpful yes. to get the details of that to be able for us to understand how we can intervene. I think that it did not hurt when we raised this question with the legislators last time. I don't know how much it helped to, to get that, but I think it did help. Uh, so, are you or Anna, are you going, either of you I going to the legislative lunch tomorrow? And are you going? Okay, we'll find out if if, if um I will make sure someone brings that up okay. um, at the legislative lunch that the city councilors are having with the legislative. Thank you. And um, I don't want to take more of your time, but if the ask that the Vermont Public Transit Association makes is uh, is acted upon that would resolve about half of our uh, funding problem and so we're probably going to ask the legislature to you know go beyond what APTA is doing so that we'll fully resolve it um, or come up with other recommendations to resolve it. thank you thank you so much um, we'll close that item and the next is the solar ordinance and rooftop regulations um, Part two. Yeah, come up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to set the stage for this one, we had. Um, we had didn't all need to come up. Well, yeah. <laughs> I thought I was yeah. leaving some room for you. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And our September yeah. make it easier for us to see you all the same time. So at our September meeting, we had uh, Andrew Chelnick from South Burlington here. Um, he shared with us. Uh, some of the South Burlington requirements for rooftop solar. And I looked at the meet, the meeting minutes yesterday, and we had, and, and uh, Bill had said he was going to um, go do some homework and come back to us in October. Well, it's, things got in the way and we were in, we postponed twice, I think. And here you are in January um, to give us a follow up on that. And if I could just add something that was lingering from prior to that was the whole question of how we regulate the installation of rooftop solar um, on homes right. and, and its relationship with the state fire code and all of that. So that's why, yes, I have the math here to help us. So my intent, and I think I at least telegraphed it to our staff, the, the, the DPI, the general plan was for me to give like a three minute overview and then let them share any thoughts and ask questions because I think what's most likely to come out of this is it's you know that your questions from the committee council members would be relevant to bring back uh, for example Burlington Electric staff because they do a, quite a bit of this with Chris Burns's team um, and also Megan from planning and zoning. But rather than bring everybody all at once, I thought we'd start with this sort of informational piece and get some of the components about the fire code taken care of, because I think it's generally low hanging fruit. So the solar ready piece for me meant, I, I looked at it from a couple of different components. Structurally sound, which is the building code, and then the location of buildings and their place and the placement of the, the roofs um, would, would end up being zoning. Um, as far as the building code, my general sense is, and that's why both Brad Biggie is here. Um, one of the he's the senior building official, and Kim as the uh, second building official or junior building official, if you will, that works for me at the Department of Permitting Inspections, the Trades Division. They issue they issue the building permits. 
So generally speaking, there are some initial conversations about rooftops, whether they were safe because they might need to be a structural evaluation to see if they would handle the rooftop load. Um, generally, the building code, yeah, Brad's been. Oh, Brad, Brad has his hand up. Do you want to say something, Brad? Yeah, I don't have a, a, a camera going here. I can't. Can, can you guys you hear, hear me? Okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. But I know I don't show as a a camera. I, yeah, you are you are listed as a um, panelist, so just if you wouldn't mind holding off for a couple minutes, we'll ask for comments. I'll give my summary, and then uh, either staff can speak and, and have counselors ask questions. I just want to make sure you can hear Sure, yeah, it does sound like we're good, just yeah. that we don't have the video back and forth. Um, so the, the structural piece Kim can speak about, uh, the zoning piece would really be some of those All right, there we go. Some of the sections that the South Burlington uh, Planning Commission member or uh, the person who spoke from South Burlington about their zoning permit was really uh, reference to aligning the buildings on the street, both where they would be put foundationally and then how the rooftops would be aligned. Those types of things are not part of what the trades team looks at. They'd really be in the the zoning ordinance, and we would bring in the planning commission for consideration of that and, and Megan Tuttle. The third piece would be once there's a design in place, one of the things I think you specifically have heard about in the New North End and other parts of the city, property owners, when they get a permit to do solar, they want to do the whole rooftop. And Kim and Brown are the ones who are reviewing those permits, but it comes back to the fire code and the, the, the Vermont uh, building code that we are under the division of Vermont, uh, the, the, the uh, fire safety, uh, the state of Vermont regulates what we can do for that. But we have our local expert, Matt, who can tell you what the fire department does for venting. <clears throat> there are some updates in the current um, code rewrites that he can speak to specifically if there are questions about that. and. Respectfully, from that time, I, you know, I'll, I'll deal with my own staff if they're upset about staying late. But if we can talk about that piece afterwards first, that way Matt could potentially get out of here earliest. Uh, but then the last piece really is about <coughs> because they are a key piece on when a project is being uh, to propose and develop. They meet with us in the planning stage and the. All of the team members uh, from the permitting process from all the different departments are here and we meet with the people before they come before the different um, either the DRB or through the design advisory board before they even submit permits to think about what their considerations are going to be. Burlington Electric is the lead on meeting with them in advance to talk about what their uh, building code requirements are going to be for energy, for weatherization, for the meeting the residential and commercial building efficiency standards. The zoning team loops back around because my team on the zoning side, when we are issuing a certificate of occupancy, when we close out a permit, we're confirming that those documents have been filed appropriately, they're on file in the clerk treasurer's office, that property owner and contractor have certified that they've met those requirements of the commercial building uh, efficiency standards and the RDES or the residential building efficiency standards. Um, so there's a, a number of different considerations in in how we do this. And then if I if I can interject real quick, um, go ahead. If, if a building has a, a solar install has a certificate of public good or a net metering number, they're exempt from zoning. So it comes down to meeting the fire code with setbacks, centerline accesses, so on and so forth. So if you're going to have a new building, the requirements for the structural loads are in the IBC. So they're already there for new construction. When we issue permits for solar on existing structures, 
the, the installers provide a structural analysis by a structural engineer that it can it, it can um <clears throat> it can uh support that load that that additional load of the panels so i i'm looking at chapter 16 of the ibc and that's the photovoltaic chapter and it it specifically outlines the requirements for structural load. Well, just to, to guide this, thank you, Brad, to guide this, I guess, do you know a little bit more you wanted to go? I think I was, the only last thing I was going to say is that it was, uh, if you recall, uh, Council Burden and I both laughed somewhat out loud when there was the conversation about the regulatory piece of what happens in South Burlington is all self-certification. And I just wanted to reassure all of the counselors that Burlington, you probably already know this, we wouldn't have had the bad reputation we've had in the past if we didn't do all of the inspections that we do. We check and double check things, Brad and Kim, that there are site inspections, and in a lot of cases, repeated site inspections, because it's not self-certification based only in Burlington. These things are done through site inspections. And we have eyes on these projects to see that things are done that way. And it's not to say anything bad about South Burlington, but I think Council Bergman and I felt the same way. If there isn't someone going out, there are almost certainly going to be people who are gonna take advantage of just a sign off on a form. So having someone go out is incredibly valuable in my book. And I trust our team you know, pretty clearly. If I, if I could just say, what, what, from my focus, it's on the, I'll call them, for lack of a better word, the performance standards, the codes themselves. And just to be really clear to start with, I, I would like us to be harmonious with those standards um, and understand where we are and where we aren't with South Burlington, because you know, our building code is sort of older there and uh, the fire code is, you know, in another place, you know, and the zoning code is there. So that's sort of what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm not really looking at the enforcement piece. I'm not really looking so much at the administrative piece and how people are going in terms of just what the regulatory framework is to, you know, and to understand the differences between what the city of Burlington has in place what South Burlington has in place and why. And, and I would add to that with a goal of trying to see where there's opportunity, right? Absolutely. To, to <clears throat> looking to maximize solar installations. Right. So, so, right. so in that sense, it sounds like the best way for me to proceed is to do a joint memo with uh, Chris Burns or Dan Springer, but probably Chris because He's the one who is directly engaged with the, the folks on this side of the road to electric department, both pre-project and throughout the project. Chris and his team are working on that specifically. He would definitely be in a better place to talk about, you know, what South Burlington is doing compared to what his team is getting done. And I could do that in advance of another meeting that you could take the, the report under consideration and then ask questions at another meeting. But I do think it's worth talking about. The, the, I had heard repeatedly about why can't we have more of the roof cover covered with panels here? And if that's a worthy conversation, it's certainly worth Matt's time to at least spend a few minutes talking about Burlington and the fire department. Absolutely. When, yeah. I, when I was first on the two, I, was it you, Matt, that came and Jen Hansen was chair? And we talked about somebody came, and I don't know if it was oh, you. It was a couple of years, couple ago. years ago. Yeah. Ago. And we talked about like um, right. the restrictions, but yeah. there was an update to, I think it was NEPA or was that the right? NFPA. NFPA. Yeah, that hasn't gone through. And it hasn't gone through. And we were waiting on that because there, we were following what's going on with the state. So looking for updates on that. Maybe you could just share. There, there hasn't been any updates. We're still under the 2015 code. They yeah. haven't adopted the 2021 code yet. Um, the 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 codes that they follow in South Burlington and across the state are the same exact codes we follow in Burlington. So if 
if South Burlington has something different above and beyond, it's because they initiated it through an ordinance. Like Burlington, we have an ordinance that swimming pools have to have fences and self-closing gates and self-latching, self-classing latching gates. It's, there's no different rules. I mean, the, the difference is South Burlington, I believe, is a hybrid between the state and South Burlington itself. The city of Burlington is not a hybrid. We have full authority in the city of Burlington to enforce the Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code. Now, at the moment, we can be more stringent than the state. We can't be less stringent than the state. But I know there's a push from the state right now to take some of that away so that we can't supersede their rules. Their focus really is on keeping housing costs low. And, and obviously ours should be as well to make sure that we're not, anything that we do doesn't make housing more unaffordable. But I think one of the considerations for Matt was there was a conversation about whether we could adopt that portion of the code for rooftops because it's in waiting with the state and the, the answer, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, the answer was we could only adopt it in its totality and not just the very specific section about rooftop solar or adding additional panels. We would have had to adopt it the entire regulatory scheme of the update, and I don't think we were ready there. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I, I reached out to them and right the basically like in NFPA one, it's chapter 11, like we have to adapt, adopt that chapter and not go back and forth. Um, but just so you're aware, the new code is actually a little more restrictive. Like the current code is only three pages long, expanded out to five pages. So it becomes a little more restrictive on where fire department access is located and how we achieve that access. Um, but it does change a little bit on um, how roof coverage is completed or used in terms of the percentage as to where your what your hold backs are, like ridge line and heat line and stuff like that. Um, so there are minor changes in there. I think a lot of changes also come down to how everything is labeled, you know, like, you know, so you know, it, they always add more labels to codes and stuff. So yeah, they're they're gonna know, they're gonna go from the three foot setbacks to a percentage of the roof covered. Yeah, if you're, the yeah, I think there's a 33% coverage and then there's a 66% coverage depending on, on what you're doing. So, and also just so you're aware right now, I don't have anything to do with the permitting process for these. That's under the building inspectors and the electrical inspectors. But what they will do is when they have a building and they're very good at understanding fire department access, they have all that training. But when there's a, Kind of a question of how would you guys deal with this? Do you consider this good access? Then they they uh, defer to me, and then I can say, yeah, we can deal with that. And then the your decision, or no, we need to because of the ladder truck ladder can't reach the roof. We need to be able to get a ground ladder here, and we are able to get a ground ladder here because of how fencing works, or something like that. So. Or, yeah, or um, overhead obst overhead obstruction right, overhead obstruction wires trees and also thinking long term of there's no fence there now but the next owner may put a fence or restrict access uh, like the back of the house uh, for that so that's all stuff we take into consideration um, a lot of what people want to do is cover from you know the eave to the roof peak and then gable in and gable in every square inch they can. And the issue there is we have to have safe access up to the peak of the roof. And then if solar is only on one side of the roof, we're okay with diminishing the 36 inch hold back that they have right now, as long as the other side of the roof is clear and that we can get to it. So like, because we need to be able to walk along the peak line be able to hook ladders over the peak lines so we but, need a certain so, dip so there. you still need enough of a setback to get a ladder hook over right. the ridge right right and it's and then also if we're on a roof because we need to vent it it's not something we do every fire it's, it's an option 
we have to be able to have, we're looking to create a minimum of like three feet by six feet of an area to cut open for a hole so that the heat and gas come out. So, because what that does, it, it lifts all the heat out of the house, you know, on the floor that we're searching it for. for. So, unfortunately, almost every house is different. You know, as soon as you throw a dormer on the house, it, it changes everything, you know, because the code does refer to when you have a valley, how close you can be to the valley. Um, and, you know, how close you can be to a dormer. Like, you can't put solar panels right in front of the dormer window if it's meant to be an egress window for fire safety. Because you have to be able to come out the window and uh, step on to the solar panels. Um, so it's a little simpler on single family homes. Commercial buildings gets more difficult with holdbacks and it's very different. But you know, the code does specifically say single family residential home, homes will follow um, these criteria for it. So it's yeah, because uh, once uh, on a on a big on a big building, once you exceed 150 feet, you go from a four foot setback to a six foot setback. Um and I just want to be clear that the codes and standards, the fire code, the the sprinkler code, the life safety code, they're all in place because stuff happened in the past and people either got hurt or got killed. That's why the codes are what they are today. And next time it comes around, it's going to be thicker than it was the last cycle because different stuff happened. It's it's just the nature of of the life safety fire code lifestyle. I don't know how else to put long, it. I spent a long time in this world as long as uh, mm -hmm. as you guys yeah. have done. And uh, I, for me, the first step I think is a comprehensive comparison of the South Burlington's code structure. And and you might yes, Kim. I just. I think that uh, maybe outside of Burlington, single family homes don't get permits. Uh, yes, I, 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 I'm but actually I not. I, I, the roots. I'm, I'm not. Yeah, in terms of, I, I want to understand what the regulatory system that they've got, what do they cover, what the codes are that, that, that they have there, what they've got, what they're with their zoning ordinance. If you look at our zoning ordinance, there is nothing related to this in that I just went well, through. Well, you're, you're talking, you're talking zoning. Yeah, and, yeah, but, but Brad, and, Brad, you gotta look at it all, and the and the more that we segment stuff, the 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 the, the more chaotic but, it is, and the but, less that we're going to be able to. We're say, regu we're regulated I, I by the division of fire safety. You're going to just bring the worst out of me. Okay. Um, because I will. What we'll do is what I'm glad. What, yeah. Finish, finish your thought. Thank you. That's all I, what I would be. So I would really like to have a multi-department group look at what South Burlington has done, all of its codes, what they've adopted, and look at what we've got and put them together so we can match them up and understand what the difference is. They are a different city. They are differently dense, although they are changing. And that's fine and fair. I'm not making a judgment as to what they have is better or worse. What I'm making a judgment is, is that I don't know what the lay of the land is. And I want to get that harmonious way we can see what we, you know, can, you know, do we need to make changes in the way that we are doing things or not? They adopt the state scopes code in here. They don't have a building department. That's right. And but they do use their zoning law like a building code. And that is standard in the state of Vermont. We are we are very uncommon. But the fact is that there are building codes in zoning ordinances. So it's not so so different that we cannot well, look at them. Okay, and again, just a minute, Brad, I'll let you in Wellington after. has the Division of Fire Safety Brad, involved. The South this Burlington has the so just Division of Fire Safety order. involved. Brad, as a point of order, the chair needs to recognize speakers before they speak. So hold on. Sorry. I'll recognize you in a second, yeah, Brad. Yeah, and there's all sorts of municipal agreements that everybody has got with the state because that's part of the delegation requirement. I negotiated three of them from the City of Burlington and the State of Vermont. So uh, 
Don't tell me about it. Okay, I'm going to back down. I'm going to back off. I'm not going to get done. I'm done here. Okay, well, well, hold that thought. I'm going to let Brad get in, then I had a question. Go ahead, Brad. So I just wanted to say that South Burlington <clears throat> is, like I said earlier, it's a hybrid because this, the Division of Fire Safety is involved. So where where we have the ability to have zoning and DPI all together is more of a streamlined process because if if there was no DPI, if there was no building in, officials in the city of Burlington, the, the Division of Fire Safety wouldn't care about zoning whatsoever. They'd just say, all right, here's your permit. If you need municipal permits of any other sort, you're on your own. But we work in, in concert on that. And, and other towns don't have the same level of authority that Burlington does. They, they let us enforce the, 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 the Vermont Fire, Fire and Building Safety Code 100%. Matt, am I speaking wrong on this? Uh, I was just looking at what the, the you know, their quick MOU breakdown is. Um, I, I think the only thing the state looks at is. is where we have is, the same uh, agreement as South Burlington. Yeah. We have yeah. the same Our agreement as South Burlington. Yeah. Authorized by state statute. Negotiated three of them. Right, but. Us in South Burlington are the only two cities that have full authority of building codes and fire codes. Yeah. Um, for it. So, uh, do you want to get out? I just want to say, I think for simplicity purposes, I do think we can do better at the next meeting by giving a, a written, we've got a little better understanding of what would be helpful uh, to get something written form prior to that, that would definitely include both Megan Tuttle and uh, the rest of the team, which is priority, of including our team at Burlington Electric. Because we've got a great team, and uh, I think putting something together so you have an apples to apples comparison is a better way to go at this. So, so yes, that's exactly what I want. Right. Yeah, that so, way we can have a shorter discussion when we come back, because yeah. all of those other facts can be laid out on paper. And so what I would what I would say is, from my point of view, I hear us. We're comparing ourselves. We want to look at South Burlington, but is South Burlington necessarily the thing we want to look at? Maybe it is. But I would say what we're really looking for, if I'm reading, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Gene, is we want to see where we can um, maximize our opportunity. If South Burlington has more has uh, a ways that they can get more rooftops or we don't have them. Let us understand why that is, right? And then see if there's opportunity there. There may be there may be reasons we can't and you would articulate these in a in a written document. Yeah. Um, or maybe there are ways we can and these are areas we could focus on either enhancing our ordinance structure some way or getting other agreements. I'm not gonna pretend yeah. to know what yeah. agreements need to be gotten for it. But but certainly, you know, the goal is how can we do more rooftop solar or or um or, and what are the uh, uh, obstacles to allowing us to be able to do that? so those obstacles will potentially come back to some of our tables yeah. here. Right. But in the meantime the, the comparison can happen first and what the you know, recommendations. Chris is incredibly articulate and beyond you know anything that I could ever explain with residential and commercial building efficiency standards. And we probably already have some of those recommendations in mind. If he's willing to put them on paper, if not, uh, we can have him come and at least suggest some things. But we will have already had a, a team review of it so that we have a better place to, to tell you what the potential roadblocks are. I mean, that would be great. I mean, the NFPA studies stuff all the time, right? The, the Academy is, is down there to do all that stuff. So they are looking at codes. You know, the I, IBC is in the same, you know, uh, property maintenance code. Everybody is looking at 
how we're doing stuff. So I, you know, to go to your second point, another, maybe it's the second step would be to look at other codes that are out, that are being talked about out there, that are being analyzed and then um, giving us a sense for what a future regulatory system could look like. But that's that's sort of afterwards. That's sort of, I mean, and that's based on, you know, I, I don't know of any city that is adopt that is not adopting national codes of some sort. So you've got cities in the West. It's a very different climates, very different topography. All of that stuff is, is understood, but people are doing things all around the country to maximize, you know, um, the getting power and 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 fuel from non-burning sources. And that's what we need to be what we need to be doing. So just trying to understand that. But we have right here in our own backyard another city that has done this stuff and we should at least understand what they're doing and how it compares to us. And for all I know, and this is why we're having this conversation, we're all on the same, we're on the same page. This is great. We're not, we don't need to change anything. I'm not trying to change something just to change something. Hannah, do you want to get in? I know you, I would, I'm just looking for your hand raised, but feel free to, to pipe in. Um, so so that, I, I, I apologize, it's been as many months as it's been since we had the first part of this conversation. Now we've got this, what do you, the next step would be for, uh, are you going to sort of champion that sort of process, Bill? I will, and I can report back to you so that you can give updates, and then we can find a, a date. Probably not the next meeting, because I can't speak for what Chris Burns and his team's availability is. If it's like ours, it's things are somewhat tight, but we'll do the best we can. If nothing else, I'll at least give you an update about what the anticipated timeline is and make yeah. sure that this team as a chemistry right. regulator. But I agree with Council Bergman. I think we may be in a position where we find we're in pretty good shape already because that was my initial assessment. I know that talking with Brad and Kim, it does feel like our rooftops are pretty solar ready already. So that's where my initial reaction was. I would be cautious only because I, would, I didn't get a chance to really speak. That meeting was wrapping up in September. So this was a much better opportunity to understand what, what would be helpful to that. I apologize. That I didn't ask, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if it would have been appropriate to ask these things in an email form to, to the uh, two members, but I'm glad we had it in this format, right? I mean, if you could ask Megan, a lot of this is about zoning, and we're they're looking at a neighborhood code, and how is it that this fits with, with that? Exactly, but, I, but I'd be willing to bet Megan's like me, she doesn't know the energy side like Chris does, which is why we're fortunate to have such a great team. We'll have all the team members involved in the next document, and then we'll go out of probably a smaller meeting, because it may just be Chris and myself that come back next time, or maybe if you're coming back to the next one. Oh, I agree. I'll, I'll, I'll invite right. everybody that wants to participate, but right, we're going right. to have a much more direct conversation next time. Go ahead, Matt. I was going to say, in reading through their solar ready ordinance, they're talking about new neighborhoods and angles of streets and angles of houses. Um, I was in a meeting with uh, members from City Hall and others about affordable building affordable housing and reducing construction costs in the city. And they're they're talking about you know taking large one acre lots to New North End and building multiple buildings on them. Um, but nothing ever came up about necessarily about solar and how those buildings are placed on the lot. So I think that's an important connection because they're going to take a square lot and just dumping square buildings down, however they best fit in, they're not thinking about solar ready exactly. angles and everything. So I think it's a exactly it's a, another committee to connect with. Exactly. This is exactly what I want. Right. So that's what I want. If we can do that then we will do something that we don't do very well in this time and have never done well, which is actually talk to each other and coordinate to come. I've, I've been on months. three separate committees on how to reduce construction costs. Uh, so it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's why having Megan be part of this is 
very, very important. Oh, good. Brad, did you want to get in again for anything before we wrap? No, I think I'm all good. Just want to check out other virtual numbers because sometimes you get lost in the Zoom meetings. Um, okay, well, thank you for coming and thank you for bearing with us and learning about GMT while GMT technologies while you wait. Uh, but we look forward to uh, hearing more about this and you know, just let me know what the timeline looks like and then you can figure out how to uh, loop it back into this committee. Excellent. We'll do. Okay. Yeah. I can reach out to Terry and Randy. Okay, great. Oh, yeah. Same eye for me, would you? Sure. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Brad. So, well, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, and, okay, and I'll be so talking next. to Chief Fran. I'll be talking to I Chief do. Francis I tomorrow. Did so a really long time. Did you? I can put a bug in his ear. Oh, He's well, 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 a top yeah. person. I think he's next Good for him. Thanks, Kenny. Neat place. Good. But they also play Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Two years. Ah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, which moves us on to our director's report. Thank you. Given the hour, I'll be short. Uh, tomorrow, uh, staff is going to the Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee because we, like you, uh, can't uh, avoid more meetings. And we will be talking about uh, the uh, proposed upgrade to the main wastewater treatment plant and working on what the impacts may be to Perkins Pier of that work. So uh, I know we've had the opportunity to talk about the uh, needed renovation to main wastewater. Uh, this is our next uh, step in working with other council committees, just for your information. Um, is that is that your update? Yep. Okay. Um, next are councilor items. Do any councilors have items they would like to speak about? No. Okay. Um, I have a couple of constituent issues that I'll talk to you about. Okay. Kind of just offline. That's fine. The meeting not to. I'm here for a long, long time. Um, and our next meeting is scheduled for uh, February twenty seventh. Does that work? That's our normal meeting time for a Tuesday. Uh, it works for me, but I have to be um, online because uh, that's fine. we're taking care of you. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to check really quickly. You said what, February 27th? 7th, yeah. And, Are we um, good with a room, Maddie? I believe so, but I will check right now. That'll be our last meeting as a as this as the currently a paneled committee. Would we be able to meet at four again? I have a work thing at five thirty. I can maybe shift things around, but earlier is better. I can work. Do you have? I, Sure. Is it might have babies running around, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's okay. Babies running around is fine. We um, may have to look for a different room, but I can figure that out and follow up. Okay. We can always meet, um, you know, for sure, whatever is available. We often do it there. Yeah. I know it's convenient for staff, but we're, yeah. we're open to okay. filing or even going down to DP or something. Right. Whatever you need. Um, Okay, and with that, and with no further business, I will adjourn us at 551. There you go. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Bye Hannah. Bye, Hannah. Cool. Less than two Recording hours. Recording stopped. Well, I like my.